Welcome to the Vital for Biz podcast. I'm Gigahertz. And in this podcast, we're going to go ahead and share with you tips, gems, stories. And it doesn't matter where you're at in your business. You're probably going to have some information that will probably level you up. So make sure to hit the follow, subscribe, and like button. Leave us a comment and stay tuned. What's going on? It's Gigahertz, and we are officially live in Las Vegas for the Vital for Biz podcast. And today I got a special guest. He goes by the name of Carl Rodriguez, and he's going to share with us a lot of great insight on the wholesale uh, Airbnb business. And uh, yeah, man, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for uh, having me, man. Absolutely. So yeah, man, uh, I know you do a lot. You don't just do the wholesaling, you just don't do real estate. So what is it that you do? Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Um, man, so let me let me start where, I mean, you could start off from the beginning. I mean, I went from, you know, in fifth grade, I, I, was, I was selling Pokemon cards, and that's when I started learning uh, this whole thing about entrepreneurship. And then, um, you know, as time progressed, I got into the, the workforce and whatnot, but um, I started selling life insurance, believe it or not. Wow. And it's crazy because it's the most boringest industry in the world, right? So, um, but man, uh, when I got into the life insurance, I realized a lot of people, you know, needed help with their credit. So I started le le learning so much about credit, credit repair, credit building, credit funding. And um, I realized that's very adjacent to real estate. And that's where everybody wants to have the American dream of being, you know, owning your own home, you know. So um, as time progressed, uh, I basically got into the wholesaling. And um, here today, I have like 60 properties, majority of them on Airbnb. And uh, it's, it's been a fun ride, man. You know? That's amazing, man. Yeah. So I know today we're going to talk a little bit about sub twos. I know it's a hot topic yep. right now. Yep, um, absolutely. I think you're one of the guys that I just came across online and you know, kind of caught me off guard because I don't see too many people <laughs> doing it. And the fact that you're already kind of ahead of the curve. And, right. You know, it sounds like you're doing really, really great already. So why don't you uh, share a little bit more about, you know, what is Sub2? Then? Sub2, man, um, it's the best thing. Uh, shout out to Pace Morby, man. Um, uh, long story short, um, in 2020, 2021, you guys remember when interest rates were like two and a half to three and a half percent interest rates and all this money that was being printed with PPP loans and, and yeah. um, you know, stimulus checks and they had the CARES Act people pulling money out of their retirement accounts. That was the best time to buy, right? Um, I bought nine properties, a few with investors, that year in 2021, going to 2022, and it was hell. Mm. So we were buying properties, you know, we had to make sure credit was on point, taxes was on point, debt to income was on point, all the red tape underwriting that we don't wanna, you know, go through that gives everybody anxiety. And then I came across Pace and I'm like watching his videos and I'm like, what do you mean you could buy properties with no banks, no credit, no taxes, sometimes not even your own money for the mm -hmm. down payment, and you get a private money lender. So to answer your question, man, what is sub two? Sub two is literally you're primarily assuming uh, somebody's loan subject to the existing loan, basically, right? And banks are going to frown upon it, or the lenders are going to frown upon it. Um, now, a lot of people ask, is it illegal? No, it's not illegal, um, but it is a violation of the loan, right? So in a sense, there's several different ways on how you can go ahead and make sure you're within compliance as much as possible, especially putting it into like a land trust or, or an LLC of some, of some sort. But um, basically, you're saving money on points trying to get the loan, and you're just going to cash out either the equity, whatever the ter determined price on the down payment would be to go ahead and buy the person's uh, uh, mortgage basically off them. Wow. So a lot of people are doing that nowadays, and uh, it's it's, you know, we we just bought 11 properties in the last three weeks, I think it was. Wow. So give or take. All in Vegas or where are they um, located? Man, we, we started in Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, being in the Airbnb space, you know, Vegas and, uh, you know, the hotels, there's this big debacle uh, with code enforcement, you know, always harassing us. But, you know, I started transitioning to Houston. I got Dallas. I got, um, what else? Uh, what is it? Florida. Uh, we're, we're in Florida. Mm -hmm. I got a unit out there. I got one unit out in uh, Flagstaff and uh, San Antonio and Austin is uh, some of the areas. Texas seems to be a little bit more lenient when it comes to all that stuff. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's uh, it's crazy because it's your private property, but then there's people still telling you what you can and can't do with it. Right. Right. You know, so, but yeah, it, there's a lot less resistance out there. 
Right. So, I mean, with sub two being somewhat new to the marketplace, uh, you know, I know home owners mm -hmm. are kind of new to that whole concept and idea. So what mm -hmm. are your biggest challenges right now when it comes to, you know, maybe finding a, a homeowner that's looking uh -huh. to sell and, you know, what, what, what kind of, what, what would make somebody want to get, you know, to sell like a, to sell their property yeah as a sub too well i mean you got to think about it at the end of the day at the end of the day it, it is a sales right so you know you got to find and ask the qualifying questions whatever that individual needs so if the seller let's just say is a veteran and he's moving to east coast or he's getting deployed you know and they're they're very conservative they just maybe got like twenty thousand dollars of equity mm -hmm. on the property or maybe they're behind their arrears are fifteen twenty thousand dollars Ideally, you just got to put the the terms on the contract, and usually I just, you know, I, I tell all the terms how it needs to be to my attorney, and my attorney basically drafts up everything, and we open up escrow, and uh, let's just say it's 15000 or 20000 or even 50000 for the down payment and entry to pay the arrears, and then plus closing costs and, and transaction coordinator, then you're able to go ahead and acquire the property. Um, believe it or not, I've, I've acquired properties from zero down, to adding an extra 300 bucks per month on top of the mortgage uh, just to provide to the individual who has uh, the property already with the loan. Um, I've had properties where I put 80,000, 100,000 down, you know, mm. but some properties on an average, I would say it's like 30 to 50,000 is the is entry point. That's pretty standard, give right. or take. But lately our buy box has been like 20,000 or less. Wow. You know, sounds like a good. So how do you, so how do you evaluate these properties? Like what, what do you look for? Yeah. Um, double or triple the, the mortgage if I'm going to short-term rent it, right? So let's say the mortgage, I acquire a property, $350,000, has a pool in um, San Antonio. It's $2,000 a month. Just right off the top, I mean, I can use AirDNA for all the new people. Uh, AirDNA is a great um, uh, data for you to go ahead and do your research because it actually extracts a lot of the information from short-term rentals. Um, but I would say... Uh, let's say I can already see that, you know, weekends probably going to be three fifty to four, five hundred dollars I do the weekends, usually uh, calculate that first. And then I'll probably do on a conservative note, let's say $100, $80, or even $150 per day on a $2,000 mortgage. You know, you look at the numbers and like, okay, well, I should probably be around five to $8,000 a month. It's a done deal, right? If you got, um, for example, like in Orlando or anywhere near the beach or downtown, those are always going to be high traffic areas, any city, honestly, as long as it's not regulated like New York. But ideally, you know, I just look at something and at the end of the day, I look at it and, okay, it's going to make money. I just, you know, I'm looking for the lowest entry and I said, and I forget it and I just, you know, find the next one. Gotcha. Yeah. So with the sub twos, I mean, obviously you've done quite a few deals. What's the success story where it's actually benefited the mm. seller? Is there anything in yeah, um, I'm working on a deal right now, and me being in the credit repair space too is I'm hooking up um, one of the uh, sellers. He just, you know, wanted to go ahead and uh, walk away from the property. Basically, was going to lose it. He's in arrears, maybe five months. I said, "Look, I'm going to come in. I'm going to take care of the arrears. Uh, I'm going to get your credit back up, and it basically, it's not going to cost me anything. the The, the goal is to go ahead and just do a long term or short term." rental on it and when the time comes when his credit's back up i'm going to go ahead and help him buy another property again wow probably more than likely through a seller finance deal right um but that's that's one story where i've helped somebody um save themselves from actually losing the actual property you know what i mean right and you know at least be able to go ahead and save that and also rectify their credit um another deal um we were about to go in foreclosure on another property this individual uh basically retired in philippines and right before the property was about to go on auction that same day my attorney was able to go ahead and put uh, a chapter 11 bankruptcy and we stopped the, the foreclosure and the auction the day of where we basically were you know going through the process of getting that property back in under our, our, our control wow so seller pretty was he pretty excited or were they pretty well yeah happy? i mean you know the the seller's like you know what i'm cool i'm retired i don't really care there, mm -hmm. there's really no equity because she owed second position on the on the mortgage so you know you probably owed like 670 but she the, the value of the home was like 650 but she's happy she's getting an extra three four hundred dollars per month you know so at the end of the day she's able to go ahead and walk away with something sounds great yeah so so how do you structure your sub two deals to where both sides are protected you know financially and legally 
How do you yeah. protect yourself and how do you, you know, protect the seller at the same time? Yeah, great question. Um, I mean, there's different ways, you know, there's a difference between seller wrap and sub two, subject to the existing loan. Subject to the existing loan is always going to be the better deal, typically. Um, but to answer your question, I always have my attorneys draft up everything. They're a second set of eyes. Uh, my job is, you know, as the visionary is basically to go ahead and just acquire properties. And they're the ones that help me consult on, hey, we need to put this under a trust or put this under an LLC or um, have you just as a power of attorney. Um, there's even a way where, uh, for example, if the bank that actually loaned the money uh, was going to go ahead and find out, let's just say because the client hasn't paid or the seller hasn't paid for 63 months, which actually has happened, um, any moment that it triggers and the antennas are going to go up, they find out the title has basically been switched. Uh, it's They're going to do a do on sale clause, right? So there's an actual um, strategy called an executory contract, which I learned from Pace. Wow. And I said, man, um, they're still on title, but I have all the rights and pretty much everything I can do with it, all the tax benefits, and I can basically flip it, sell it, whatever. The last part is basically just putting in and recording it right before it happens. You know what I mean? Right. So I know recently the interest rates have kind of dropped a little yep. bit. I know the interest rates were, were rising for, for a while. I know people were uneasy. So with sub two, where it's at now, do you feel like it's going to become more of a viable thing or do you feel like it's going to fade off? Mm -hmm. Where do you see sub two going in the near future? No, I think sub two is here to stay uh, unless some, you know, big regulatory actions and policies start changing. Um, I mean, as an entrepreneur, most of us, we're always thinking, you know, how to do things, um, not through the, like what the matrix is taught, you know, basically everybody's over here always trying to be creative. Uh, as long as, you know, like Elon Musk has said, you know, as long as we're not doing anything illegal, mm -hmm. that's really at the end of the day, you know, we're not hurting people. That's, that's, you know, it's here to stay, to be honest with you. So, um, I think a lot of the properties and for those of you that are watching, uh, properties that are, let's say, in the $400,000 range, when the interest rates drop from 55 right now, give or take, to 4 let let's just say in a year, next summer or end of next year, that $400,000 house is going to be a $500,000 house, right? Because the values of these homes, everybody that is sitting on the sidelines is going to want that same house. And people don't buy the properties based on the, the purchase price. They buy it based on affordability and what they can afford per month, right? So at the end of the day, it's like, you know, this is the time where, as a matter of fact, uh, for those of you that basically waited, you know, two and a half, three and a half percent interest rates in 2020 and 2021. Well, the boat, if you missed it, guess what, man? Like the boat came back around and you can actually buy properties at two and a half and three and a half percent, which I've bought several already this year uh, and basically ride the appreciation wave when the rates do drop. So. It's a it's a big opportunity for a lot of you guys to really get into the sub two community. You know, I, I feel it. You know, that's something uh, I've been looking into myself, and you know, I've been uh, lucky enough and fortunate to have friends around me that are kind of mm -hmm. teach me and coach me right now. So, I guess, do you recommend the sub two strategy for you know new real estate investor oh, myself, or do you for more 100%. of the experience? Yeah. It's um, think of it this way, man. Uh, you have so much more ability to acquire as much more properties especially in a time right now, which, you know, I, I foresee appreciation going up if the, if the market drops, let's say another one or 2% in the next two to five years, which it's very possible, right? Once that happens, your appreciation, let's say you got 10 houses, they're all worth 400,000. They go up a hundred grand in the next five years. Well, you have a million dollar net worth now because just on the equity, on the appreciation, and all you did was manage the property. You didn't even pay the mortgage because you had a long-term tenant or a short-term tenant or a mid-term tenant that was basically paying down not just the mortgage at the time when you bought it that was already basically cheaper, but also you got the principal pay down. So your net worth is probably going to be maybe 1.5, you know what I mean? Or even more than that. So there's a lot of different ways, but I will say um, I'm not against traditional unless it's like a property you really, really want to get. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, shout out to, you know, Navy Fed, Navy Fed, man, uh, or even veterans. Veterans, uh, I will say, I tell all my veteran clients and mentees, I said, all of you guys could be uh, millionaires right now. You know what I mean? You just got to buy a property and upgrade every single year utilizing your VA loan. Wow. And 
rent it out the previous the previous property rent it out and go upgrade to the next property and just keep doing that and keep increasing your cash flow and same thing with any navy fed um uh patron they have access to um a zero down loan believe it or not you know so you should be doing that every single year qualifying you know there's fha you can always keep upgrading um but they have a conforming limit on how much you can get but you know anybody can do this to be honest with you absolutely so a little bit about the uh your, your real estate journey yeah how, how'd you get started or when did you get started and was it las vegas where everything yeah. kind of took off great question man um I was running a leasing company for Uber and Lyft drivers, and this was before Hertz and, and Enterprise, right? Mm -hmm. um, we had, I think, 16 Priuses, and we ran the 12-hour uh, shift uh, on and off for the Uber drivers, and this was in San Diego with my boy Antoine. We had a nice, beautiful house in um, Soledad Mountain in La Jolla, and um, it was doing well. We were doing like maybe 25, 30 grand a month gross, like 15, 16 cars or something like that. But one thing I will say is that I didn't like that I had to deal with parking tickets. I had to deal with tows. I had to deal with accidents or there was a flood and a car was down. So our revenues would go down and the vehicles didn't appreciate. I mean, mm -hmm. we were doing an oil change every three weeks. We're talking like 10 to 15,000 miles every three weeks. Wow. Because these cars were running 24 seven. Wow. Right. That's mm -hmm. what the taxis do. 12 hours on, they switch it off to the next driver from 4 a.m., 4 p.m., 4 p.m., 4 a.m., and the car's just going, right? But these Priuses, man, they're like tanks, bro. So any case, long story short, I um, I got into the Airbnb game. We rented out um, apartment uh, C12. It's funny because we have an inside joke. We're like, man, we're going to make a club called C12 one day. Because when we were running that Airbnb, and we did Airbnb arbitrage, we didn't own it, right? But it was my old place, and I moved into the house. We were running our business. And um, our rent was like 1300 bucks. It was making like $4,500 a month. Mm. And at that point, I was like, all right, well, we got to get some housekeepers because I ain't trying to, you know, I ain't trying to clean the house anymore, <laughs> man. But it was like a two bedroom. It fit three beds right. comfortably. And I saw the revenue was there and it was a lot more stable. I said, imagine if I could go ahead and scale this business where I actually own the properties. Mm. How much more wealth can I compound? Because at the end of the day, every business is great. Don't get me wrong. It's all about making money. But the question is, that's level one in business is making money. Level two is how much do you get to keep after Uncle Sam comes into your pocket? You right, know what I mean? Right. So right. at the end of the day, I was like, okay, well, I started learning that. And I said, you know what? I can get 10 properties. We started scaling, getting a couple properties over there. And it was like literally across the street from uh, Mesa College, which is a community college over there. And it blended right in with all the, you know, fraternity people, right? So um, that's how I got in. Um, then I moved in. I started doing life insurance part-time. I moved into a luxury apartment and um, I was paying 2,800 a month. And then I was like, people were telling me, Patrick, but David was saying, learn how to work your pay plan. And when he said that, not just where you work, but also what you pay in taxes. Mm. So, you know, in California, it's like 13% state tax. Right. I said, okay, so if I make a hundred grand, I'm going to pay federal no matter what. Right. But the 13%, you know what 13, $13,000 can do in a single year. Right. Man, I moved out to Vegas and we were flipping a house and then I ended up moving into the house because it was cheaper to go ahead and buy the house and pay the pay the actual mortgage than to actually rent a two bedroom apartment. So I got that property and then that's how it all started. I fixed it up as I lived there. I Airbnb it, thirteen hundred dollar mortgage, and then it was making twelve, thirteen grand a month. This mm. was back in twenty twenty. Wow. You know? And it didn't even have a pool yet. You know what I mean? And we blended in with all the, you know, people that were, you know, Two o'clock in the morning, mariachi bands are, are are singing and you know doing their thing. We got bachelor parties going, in, so they blended right in in the community. You know, so it was all good, man. And then Amazing. we just we just kept on going from there. So there is this trend. I mean, it, I've I've noticed it. I don't know if you have where a lot of Californians have moved to to Las Vegas. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, what is, what are some of the trends? What are the key trends that you're seeing right now in Las Vegas, especially after the pandemic? Yeah, for all the locals, you know. Um, I'm telling you guys right now, acquire as much real estate. It's so cheap uh, in the eyes of any Californians or New York people, right? But primarily Californians because it's just a hopscotch away, right? Um, they're going to outbid, and this is my prediction, in maybe the next two to five years, you're going to see home prices over here, apples to apples, right? Like a three-bedroom, two-bath, 
uh, not the best neighborhood. Let's just say a decent neighborhood, hardworking neighborhood, but on the little bit on the rougher side. Probably be eighty to ninety percent of the same prices of the homes in you know Southeast LA or East LA, you know mm. what our East Side would be. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I, I think um, you know it, it, this is the time to acquire. Um, if the market goes down, just make sure you put yourself in a position to be cash heavy because you could go buy more uh, that are on sale. But the trajectory, it's given. Vegas is a hot spot. People internationally come out here. You got Formula One, all the you know teams coming over here. Um, this is the entertainment capital. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So if you want to go to the beach, cool. You can go 45 minutes right over to Frisco or or San Diego or L.A., right. and it's not even that far. You know, right. you're just an airplane right away. So, yeah, man. So what advice would you give to someone, you know, looking to get started in real estate? Yeah. You know, that's, I mean, what's the best entry point, in yeah. your opinion? Yeah. I, I would say top three things. Number one, find a mentor mm-hmm. who's already ahead of you and just follow exactly what they're doing, right? Um, five plus five is 10. Two plus eight is 10. Negative 10 plus 20 equals 10. The question is, <laughs> which direction do you want to go? And having multiple mentors is okay, but make sure you focus with one mentor that is the lifestyle that you want, right? That's the first thing. Second thing is um, definitely leverage the hell out of your credit. You know what I mean? Credit is great, you know, having perfect credit. You're, you're not going to have perfect credit as an entrepreneur. You know, you're going to have some little blemishes here and there, but all that stuff could be fixed. You know what I mean? Um, leverage the hell out of your credit, invest into your credit because, you know, if you, let's just say you got some people who are going to help you get funded five to $10,000, it'll probably cost you, right? Because there's a succession fee. They get you $200,000 worth of credit cards. Right. You can easily access four, five, six houses out of those 200,000 and you didn't have $200,000 worth of credit cards today. Well, guess what? You now got four or five properties you could throw on Airbnb and now you can go quit your job. Right. Imagine that's a lot of value right there. Just leveraging credit because you personal? live in America. Is that personal credit I would or business? Everything personal everything. business. I mean, obviously um, some of my guys, you know, uh, shout out to OPM mastery. They, they're getting people, you know, credit cards, 0% interest rates, average clients within the first 60 to 90 days, 80 to $120,000. But if they got a thick file, mm-hmm. man, they can get them a quarter million. And then within six months, we'll probably be at a half a million plus. So you get in lines of credit then, and then your business credit's established, and there's so many things. You could easily just start buying real estate like you're at Walmart, just, I want that house, I want that house. Especially if you got, you know, properties you're finding. Like, there's groups on Facebook that you find $8,000, $15,000 are mm-hmm. the down payments. I'm right. like, dude, I can buy that with my credit card. Right. And then it sets it, you know, sets it up for itself. Um, but, yeah, outside of that, and then, um, man, the third thing is, man, find yourself – a partner that you're in alignment with, that you want the lifestyle with. Um, shout out to my wife, mm-hmm. uh, Mitra. Um, without her, I, I don't know if I would even be able to do it um, because she holds the fort down and, and you know, entrepreneurship, it's, it's a lonely road, man, but it's, it's also very tough. And, um, you know, without, without the proper partner who's in alignment, with what your goals and dreams are, you know, it's going to be very difficult to go ahead and succeed. Mm. You know, so that, that's, that, I would say that's top three. Okay. Very nice. So what are some of the common mistakes you see new investors make when they first started, you know, getting into real mm-hmm. estate? Um, common mistakes. For some not, of the new investors, right? Yeah. Not getting a mentor. Right. Um, that, that's definitely got to be one. Um, I would say, you know, just, trying to wing it, you know, not having proper contracts when it comes to acquisitions, um, people not paying through escrow. Uh, (laughs) I myself am guilty of that. I've been, I've been scammed, man. Um, but you know, I've used that opportunity instead of, you know, why is this happening to me? I use it as, you know, what is this trying to teach me type of thing, you know? So, um, but 100%, um, always use escrow for sure. Absolutely. So what role does networking play in, in, in your success in real estate, as a real estate investor and how can someone build valuable connections in your industry? So you're saying what role can somebody say that again? So what role does networking play mm-hmm. in your success? Oh, as it's a real huge. Estate it's huge. Mm-hmm. Um, the sub two community, um, they're what's crazy is that I'm not even in the sub two community. 
but I'm sure there's a lot of value over there. But I've built, I've been doing wholesaling and, and, and seller finance prior to even, you know, knowing about it because deals just came across. But I, I will say networking, they say the more hands you shake, the more money you make, right? Um, getting really out there on social media, letting everybody know what you do. Um, there's always going to be somebody out there who wants to buy a house who probably has the cash, but doesn't have the credit or the taxes or, you know, just doesn't think they can qualify, but they're actually a lot closer than they think because they're one person away from actually finding the, the house that they want. And maybe they even have the cash or maybe they don't even have the cash. They probably have the credit and they can build the credit and utilize the credit to go buy the house. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there's different ways, but, um, Outside of, you know, really maximizing the whole market, you know, you're across all 50 states. There's properties, if you, especially if you want to start expanding to different states. It's very, very important to go ahead and be out there and, and get in your social media game up. And uh, deals will start coming to you. There's a, there's a saying, it's either you're looking for people or people looking for you, right? It's always easier for people to go look for you because at the end of the day, you get to cherry pick which deals you want to go ahead and do but also you get to say no a lot more you know and um i think that's also one thing that a lot of entrepreneurs uh who don't succeed is they don't learn how to say no you know so but yeah definitely that's that's one of the best things gotcha so how do you balance your portfolio between your long-term investments like mm -hmm. your rental properties yeah and then your short-term investments you know like more of the high-risk opportunities yeah um well first and foremost i i would say Anything is Airbnb rule. Mm. Airbnb more than likely has probably a 90% success rate. As long as you're not being stupid on committing to a high mortgage or high rent, if you're going to do rental or arbitrage, right? I know people who are getting really creative. Um, I mean, it's crazy that I was in LA once and by the beach area, I don't know if it was either Redondo or Venice before all the craze, there was like a GMC or a Dodge Ram like those old school ones, like 1990 or 2000s, maybe even 1980s, right? And they have the, the bed and they have like a small little kitchenette. And they were like a little mobile home, right? Well, people would be popped up right next to the, to the beach and they're charging $150, $200 a night. Wow. I said, so it's anything's possible with Airbnb. Right. Uh, I know some people that are just buying land now and they're just making it a very nice glamping area, charging four to $600 a night. Wow. And they'll just buy the land and like these, these tents cost them 10 grand. You know what I mean? So, you know, but primarily I would say I do a lot of my Airbnbs basically is my first priority. Um, I get a lot of long-term and midterm tenants through the Airbnbs. I mean, when you have 60 units, there's always somebody that's just like trying to go to a hotel or whatever. Right. But then you'll go ahead and you'll start be able to get some of these people through the Airbnb platform, reach out to you, get on a call, and next thing you know, you're doing a long-term tenant. Wow. And it might be for a property that maybe is not performing very well, not getting the traffic. Well, that's how we're able to go ahead and make sure that the long-term tenants are are taking care of the units that we thought were going to do okay. So, but yeah, I would say that's that's one, one of the best things. Uh, the plan is to go to 100 units short-term all across the U.S., and maybe even the Philippines, I'm looking to build out a resort out there. Wow. But uh, I think long-term is like, okay, it's peace of mind. You just put somebody in there, you set it and you forget it, pay your mortgage or pay your rent. And uh, over time, you just start building that cash flow and that equity slowly. So you, you focus on the short-term? That somehow I'm completely it rolls into aggressive, the... yeah. Completely okay. aggressive on the short-term. Gotcha. So what are your thoughts on diversification within real estate? Should investors focus on like one type of property or... Mm -hmm. What are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, first thing I always recommend, if you want to get into the STR game, right, um, open up Airbnb, set up your, your properties up, and also Verbo. Do both right off the get-go because then you always have two to go ahead and make sure you're as close as possible to 100%. Um, but I would say uh, to find a niche of do you want to focus on high traffic and being engineered like my boy Hamza, he has like, in three years, he, he got 500 units, basically wow. all arbitrage, by the way. But the hack is he would negotiate this thing called a concession. And so he was doing like 20, 30 units probably at a time. So he would, you know, Amazon deliveries, whatever. 
everything's being assembled within one to two weeks, ring cameras and all the, you know, scalage locks. He was focusing on that. And I think one month uh, this year, he did like 1.8 million. He's probably at like maybe a 35, 40% margin. Correct me if I'm wrong. But, you know, that's a $600,000 profit somewhere in that vicinity, right? So he's in the in the game of like hotels, mm. studios, one bedrooms. But he'll scale it out where he'll put, you know, curtains in the middle of the of the living room, cut it in half, and then basically turn it into two beds over there to increase the spectrum when somebody's searching for the filters of higher occupancy, wow. right? So, but, you know... Um, I know he has some luxury units there too, and um, but yeah, I mean he he does he does phenomenal, and especially in the small the smaller units. But um, for us, I love the single family pool where you can throw events. You know, we're charging two fifty three hundred dollars sometimes on a Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, not even on Friday or Saturday, and there'll be a bachelor party or a birthday or a baby shower, and how many people they're gonna have twenty twenty five, and our property can handle it. So we'll go ahead and we'll charge an extra five hundred or a thousand dollars on top just to host an event. You know what I mean? Because we have to have like securities and stuff like that just in case some things go down. You know what I mean? Um, but I like that space. Um, I'm starting to get into the luxury game. Um, I got a couple flips right now that you know they're. We had one property we we were renting. It was about a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars a night, give or take. It was on pace to doing thirty thirty five thousand a month. Wow. Um, mortgage is like twelve grand. But at the same time, we're rehabbing it. We want we want to make it all nice and pretty now. So you know we're 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 getting into that space now to to do big events and stuff. Gotcha. So I'm not sure if I remember correctly, but how did you first get into the to the Airbnb investing, and you know what really attracted you to the whole short term rental? Yeah. Um. My first house buying out here, I bought it for two hundred seven, two hundred seven thousand by accident. By the way, I wasn't wow. supposed to buy that house. I moved in because I said, you know what, I'll take over the the, the hard money payments and um uh, the property wasn't really being fixed as fast as we thought it would be so i just said you know what let me take over on it let me cash out the investors on mm. that flip and when i moved over there it's like east side um eight minutes away from downtown fremont um this was back in 2018 when i acquired the property 2020 um we threw it up on airbnb towards the end of the year um i remember it was literally right after fourth of july july 5th we threw it on 4th of July, um, but it didn't get passed through clearance. July 5th, I woke up, and our prices were, like, super low. And we were booked all the way until, like, November, December. It was crazy. Wow. All the weekends, a lot of the the days, because we, we weren't able to go ahead and access our, um, our, our listing, right? So long story short, I said, okay, this month we made seven grand. Next month we made, like, eight, 9,000. Then... When you're running like one unit, you have a lot of effort and energy you can put into that one unit to make sure that the guest reviews are perfect. Nothing's wrong with the house, right? So that's what we did. I mean, we had Mondays and Tuesdays. Our mortgage is thirteen, twelve hundred bucks a month. Mm -hmm. Imagine we're charging three thirty, three fifty on a Monday. Wow. <laughs> I mean, so right. four Mondays pays the mortgage. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Imagine all the rest of the days, and we were like ninety nine percent booked. Wow. So that's not even including events. So sometimes it would peak up to 14 grand. I said, hon, we got we to gotta scale this puppy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Wow. So it was, it was funny, man. Um, but yeah, when, when we did that, we, we got our primary residence. We bought it for like 575. Our interest rate for that one is 3.25%, $3,100 mortgage. I said, man, let's just Airbnb this. Let's see what happens. Hmm. We Airbnb'd it. It was making 12 grand. And these are properties with no pools. Wow. So when you wanted cash flow, you got to get something with low interest rates. Right. Now a lot of people are trying to get into the Airbnb game, 5 6 7%. Cash flow is gone. It, the cash flow is going to the banks right now because right. the interest rate is so right. high. So I used to, you know, I was crowdfunding some investors, and we were making sometimes two, dollars $3,000 each. But now it's gotten a little bit more saturated, especially in Las Vegas. You know, so our right. ten, twelve thousand dollar months are not there anymore. They're like eight to nine thousand sometimes. You know what I mean with a pool. Um, but investors typically will get five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars. I would say on an average per month, assuming nothing breaks. Um, but still, at the same time, it's still good. You know what I mean? It still pays for itself. You got the gotcha. appreciation and and the taxes uh, to to write off. So besides the low interest rates, right? That's I know that's a good factor. Yep. I mean, are there are there any other factors in terms of like you've 
looking for a property that would turn into a good Airbnb rental. Yeah, my boy Antoine just sent me a, a deal over in um, Temecula. Wow. And uh, he just got paid $40,000, him and uh, his fiance or for his wife, um, Jenny. They, um, yeah, they got paid 40000 to host basically the, the wedding. Uh, it's like a vineyard with views. And he's like, man, we got to get this property. It's like $700,000, right? And that's probably going to need at least $100,000, $150,000 in rehab. But mm. you got the views. You got a lot of space. You know, so there's like these, basically these niches basically now that we want to get into that have high projections. Because, you know, scaling and making an extra fifteen hundred to 2000 it's cool. But at the end of the day, you got 100 properties. You're, you're doing, you know, very, very well. Mm -hmm. 100000 200000 a month right. net, right? Right. So, you know, I like those businesses where they're going to have higher projections and lower risk, um, but they have to be a little bit more actively managed with the proper staff. So, so what kind of ROI should a, an Airbnb investor expect, you know, compared to, yeah. you know, doing the traditional long-term rentals? Yeah. Well, um, well, you don't make money in long-term rentals. Let's, let's be honest. Okay. Um, if you bought a property, let's say in today's rates and the mortgage is three grand, you're probably going to rent it out for 3,200. Right. right if you just did the whole house now that's the whole house and you got the hvac's gonna go out the the water heater's gonna go out a pipe's gonna burst or a toilet's gonna you know there's something's gonna go on and if you're making 200 dollars in cash flow times that by 12 it's only 2400 bucks in reserves let's be honest you're gonna spend more than that probably just to fix some repairs right so at the end of the day um i don't think it's a cash flow game. I think if you have a W two or you have a high net, um, high earning job, and you buy real estate, the benefits are more for your tax benefits wow. because you get all the depreciation over twenty seven and a half years that you can offset on your W two, right? Then you also have this thing called a cost segregation. That's where your cash flow is going to come from. Now, if you go in the midterm, you're going to get a better margin, maybe five hundred to three thousand dollars on an average assuming everybody gets paid. Um, but short term, it could be break even, sometimes even 90% of what the mortgage is. You might go you know, a little bit less because sometimes I, I had a property where the Sandhill property, actually the, the pipe burst and it collapsed. Mm. And in 48 hours, I literally had to drill in the middle of the living room right next to the couch, put new piping, lay tile, find the tile, lay the tile, and then basically have our reservation for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, which was like an eighteen hundred dollar reservation. Make sure that there's no <laughs> issues. So imagine right. like, and then plumbers were charging me. I think it was like fifteen to eighteen grand, three different wow. bids. So my guys, my team, it cost us maybe like eighteen hundred bucks. So and it's not the time because those guys were not available until like next week to wow. do this big job. So that would cost me two weeks. Imagine if I didn't have my guys or a savior. You know what I mean? So we were able to save the money that we were basically generating every single day. We just had to cancel one reservation. Gotcha. So how do you handle management for these, for these Airbnb properties? Yeah. You know, do you, do you recommend using like a property management company for investors? Depends on how involved you want to be. Um, I mean, you know, if you're somebody who just wants to go ahead and get a property and pay less in taxes, then you get a property management because the drunk people are not able to go ahead and process the code at two o'clock in the morning. They're not calling you. They're calling the property management. Highly recommended. Property management can be anywhere from 10 to 25%, depending on what the deal is. You know what I mean? Mm. So the more experience and the more staff that they have on site uh, that can go ahead and fix problems, then, you know, you're, you're going to charge, they're going to charge you more because they have access to everybody. Right. But then there's people that, you know, just, you can have your daughter or, brother or whatever anybody right do the property management give them 10 15 percent they're going to be happy but you still got to outsource well then you know you can build it that way right but that's what i recommend um but anybody who's kind of getting in you know their feet wet be very transparent and let them know and says hey uh, i'm going to hire you but i'd like to learn i don't mind paying you and then basically going from there and then eventually start your own business that way gotcha so in a competitive airbnb market like las vegas you know, what do you do to like make your listing stand out? Man, anything 
man, my listings are going to go uh, uh, not as competitive because I'm going to give the sauce right now. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you, you can see, that you, away. yeah, but no, you can see like anything with a lot of nice lights. Gotcha. Like, man, that stuff stands out. Like if you look at my Sandhill property, it has a purple uh, ambient light that illuminates the pool. And it's like my Sandhill property is in the east side, but it, cr it cranks. It makes money. You know what I mean? And it has a purple ambiance on the pool and it has a pool table, a TV right next to the pool table outside. And there's like patio seating and stuff like that. And, you know, the inside, it's it's probably like 1,300 square feet. It's nothing crazy. We barely did uh, any remodel outside of just getting it up and running. But it's the outside that really sells. And uh, my boy, um, uh, Joe Fraser, uh, he, he hooked me up with the pool. Uh, it cost me almost 100 grand uh, just to put the pool in there. And that pool literally is what is bringing that money in the traffic. Wow. So investing yeah. to the aesthetics. At 100%. Gotcha. More lights. A lot of the, you know, design is very important, as a lot of people don't think. It's, you don't want to make it look like a Motel 6. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Uh, but, yeah, outside of that, you know, just do, make it cool. Do pictures matter? Like the quality of pictures? And oh, 100%. Video um, content? Like, here, yeah, here, here's what I will say. So, yeah. you know, when you get f f your first property... The goal is to go ahead and get it up and running as soon as possible. Right. That's what I call stabilizing, right? Or that's the term. It's called stabilizing. So you're not coming out of pocket anymore. Second uh, level would be where you make it operable and it's making some cash flow, right? Then the third level would be make it an optimal, which is like, okay, I'm going to go throw. This property is going to be a Marilyn Monroe, Las Vegas theme. You got Elvis in one room and different rooms, kind of like this las vegas theme or you can make it a bachelor uh bachelor house looking you know what i mean so there's different things that people would look out and you got to ask yourself what is your x factor compared to what the other competition has to offer outside of more beds more square footage a pool pool tables ping pong tables a, a big tv a, a open space you know what i mean those are different little things that some people will look for and also um uh let's just say if you add um, a desk, just a computer desk, just to be able to go ahead and have someone do their work. That is very big because yeah. imagine you're looking for a property and let's just say it's, you know, two people, but you need a computer desk. You don't right. care about anything. You don't want to use a kitchen table, right. but you want to be on a computer desk. And I have a property at 16 people has everything and it could fit a computer desk, but you clicked on the search, a computer desk. I'm not going to show up. Make sense. Yeah. So at these sense, you know, having a computer desk, having a, um, what is it? Even a crib, bro, a crib. Some people look for a crib in their baby property. crib. Yeah. Baby crib. Gotcha. Yeah. So it, that definitely helps. So what about like running ads? You know, do you see people doing that? Does that work? I was always curious. Yeah. 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 I, honestly, I, I should be doing that. Okay. You know what I mean? Uh, for my more premier properties, majority of my properties, I would say they're in the operable state. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of properties. I'm just in the acquisition mode right now. So I'm going to go ahead at some point, I'm going to cherry pick which houses I really like that do well, good financials, good cash flow, and I have a good staff and team out there. And then I'm going to go ahead and convert it to themed, you know, different properties and stuff like that. Gotcha. Yeah. So, you know, what tips would you give someone thinking about turning a traditional rental property into an Airbnb rental? Yeah. Um, I mean, you could always, it doesn't hurt to start off with a room. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Kind of get, just get your feet wet. Uh, slow, starting slow is, is better than not starting at all, right? So, you know, convert a room, make it comfortable, keep the house clean. Yeah. And you can rent a room for $49, $59 a night plus cleaning. Sometimes you make a little spread on the cleaning too. That's up to you. But, you know, sometimes that one room on Airbnb will pay your mortgage, believe it or not. Two, three thousand $3,000 a month. Gotcha. So yeah, I just want to kind of reflect. I know we talked about quite a few topics here. Yeah. Uh, what's the biggest lesson you've learned as a real estate investor? Man, um, biggest lesson I've learned. Um, when it comes to buying massive properties or big properties, right? Definitely have everything go through escrow on contracts. Right. Because, man... I went through a lawsuit. Um, long story short, I've I've was able to go ahead and uh, get four times or three times the damages. Wow. But now the question is, am I going to get the money? You know, because I don't have to go search for it for the, my life. You know, yeah. so um, that's one thing. Um, 
but definitely uh, i would say you know getting a mentor um I, I always had a mentor in the financial industry um selling life insurance and retirement plans and and doing all that stuff and then i got into this and i had no mentor to be honest and uh i've, I've probably made enough mistakes that i should have but um i did go to conferences and i started learning from some people and so now i'm plugged in with a lot of uh, individuals like chris crone and uh, kobe sperber uh patrick but david um he's always been you know uh, one of my mentors back in the financial industry and um uh, I mean, there's just a, a numerous amount of things. Finding a mentor is definitely one of the best things you could do. Absolutely. No, I totally agree. So how do you stay motivated, you know, in this competitive market? Like what keeps yeah, you going? Yeah, man. Um, you know, it's funny because my mom, you know, we grew up extremely poor. I'm talking section eight, you know, three bedroom, two bath. And uh, my mom, you know, she's she's in San Diego or in Vegas and she stays with me and she doesn't know, but I'm actually going to get her, I'm going to give her one of my houses so that she can go ahead and live. And she has people basically that when they're coming into Las Vegas, they can go ahead and visit her at her house now. You know what I mean? But um, my mom is one of my biggest motivators, number one, um, because she didn't quit. She, she was working at Mervyn's at the shoe department. She would go take 45 minutes to an hour, taking the bus from the hood, right? Mm -hmm. And coming home at night you know, no complaints, but still was able to go ahead and take me back to school shopping, you know, every other year, <laughs> right? But at the same time, like, that's what motivated me. And I said, you know what? Um, poverty is just a generational, cur generational curse that is passed on from one generation to the other. And I said, this is where it stops, right? This is where it stops. And I said, I want abundance, and so how do I stay motivated? I mean, my mom keeps telling me that I need to go ahead. I just need to slow down because I'm pretty much retired, right? We're doing a quarter million, 300 grand a month, mm. 30, 40% margin. Not bad. Maybe 70, 80,000. You're, you're pretty solid. I got eight cars. I don't, I don't drive everything. <laughs> Probably 3,000 miles or less on each car, right? Wow. I got a paid off GTR and go get a bunch of other things. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's like, okay, well, okay, what else is there to motivate me? I'm all, I've always been a guy who always worked. Yeah. So I, I actually told my staff and my wife, I said, you know, what's going to keep motivating me is I want to go build a school in the Philippines. Mm. And not just a school to teach education and go climb into this matrix. <laughs> I want to go teach people about business. Right. I want to teach entrepreneurship. Because Philippines, man, I'm telling you, a lot of these people – they have very little and it's one of the most happiest places everybody out there usually yeah. has a big smile and they're freaking hard workers bro and so i think that you know building a school out there and teaching entrepreneurship and you know eventually you know going international i think it would be very big and and, and i would love to be a, a part of you know the history of, of building philippines and entrepreneurship that sounds cool man yeah. you know giving back giving 100 back to, your, man. to your community and and you know back yeah. to yeah. That fulfillment is is something that money can't buy. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So, I mean, looking back at your journey now, uh, is there anything that you feel like you would do maybe a little bit differently? Oh, man. Um, yeah. I mean, if I knew everything that I knew now yeah. and I was back at 18, I would, first off, Make sure my, my, my influence of individuals that I'm around majority of the time, and sometimes it's even family, believe it or not, right. that could be so toxic or negative, and that will hold you from moving and progressing to the person that you want to be, Yeah. right? But I would say make sure you're, you're the top five people that you hang around with are either ahead of you or somewhere near, you know, with you, um, and, or they just want to be in the game, and they have big aspirations in life, right? right. If that's what you want, because... At the end of the day, success is based on your terms. It's not based on what anybody puts on you. Because you can make a six-figure income anywhere. And let's just say if that's all you wanted, then you're successful, right? Um, but I would definitely change my group of friends and make sure that I would be motivated to go ahead and keep working with them, have a brotherhood. Um, I would definitely get a high-ticket type of sales job, learn everything about sales, whether it's life insurance, solar, real estate, mortgages, wholesaling um hvac is actually really good too because that's big sales 
kitchen sales. I mean, there's anything in sales, right? As long as you're making a good five to ten thousand dollars, let's say per contract, that's a solid, solid deal. And then utilize that and invest into real estate. Second thing would be learning how to raise capital. Learning how to raise capital in sales, you can be a billionaire. Wow. It's the biggest hack because at the end of the day, as long as you have an idea and you can help somebody get returns or help them improve their cash flow or their opportunity in life. I agree. Raising capital is, is like, you know, I got clients that will just wire me a hundred grand, two hundred grand wow. because they they know what I'm about. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's what it was able to propel me um here today. Um definitely baby my credit. I would buy a property every single year, upgrade into another property, cash flow and rent the, the previous properties as I go. Um, if you're going to get married, don't get married until both of you guys both get a fourplex each and then wow. get married because yeah. you could do it with the FHA loan. Wow. Right? And then now you got eight units. You're <laughs> literally getting out of the, the, the race, uh, the rat race right wow. away. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, you know, just involve yourself with the right people and then, you know, give back. And I think giving back as a way where even if you're spending money or 10, 20, 30% of your money, it's going to come back because people that, you know, are buying from you, they know what you're about and you're, because they're buying from you, you it's kind of like they're helping contribute into that cause. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So what's the next big goal for Carl Rodriguez? Oh man. For you um, your, your business here. I'm about to lock up a, a $2 million, uh, 72 unit, um, wow. Hotel, boutique mm -hmm. hotel in Corpus Christi. Um, I have a, a, the ambitions right now to go ahead and get the land for the villas uh, in Coron Island uh, in the Philippines. It's one of the seven wonders of the world, to my understanding. Beautiful waters. Wow. I went out there. It's very rural. Yeah. You know, we're talking like chickens and and you know the meats and the poultry was all cu cut up in the morning and it's all sold in the market like by noon. Yeah. You know, all on ice. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, there's a lot of opportunity over there for the hotel industry and, and travel. Um, Sounds beautiful. like Cambodia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bro. Uh, I mean, that's yeah. that's another place I want to go: Cambodia and yeah. Thailand and all of Southeast Asia. But yeah, um, I think just setting those things up, and then I think after the villas and getting up my resort in the Philippines, uh, my next project would be is to start the schools. Yeah, and, yeah, I like yeah, that. Which it's probably maybe a year or two years from now. Wow, yeah. soon. That's yeah coming up here so what's the best advice yeah that you've ever received man um i think just taking extreme ownership even though you think you're at fault or or you're not at fault that mm -hmm. you take extreme ownership that it is your fault yeah because there's always something that you could have done to prevent or mitigate the cause you with me right for sure um, a lot of people, especially in this generation, falls into the victimhood. And I think that's the reason why, uh, you know, Andrew Tate said, you know, the people that are the kindest are the ones that went through hell. You I agree. I mean? like, because they, they know what it's like. You know yeah. what I mean? So, um, you know, I think, I think, you know, we just, I think everybody just needs to give back a little bit. You know, I, I understand, you know, we all have the ability to buy, sell, try and fail living in America. But at the same time, I think, you know, we, we got to give back a little bit too. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I agree. So where can our listeners connect with you? Where can they find you uh, online yeah, here? And, um, we got a pop-up event later today. Awesome. <laughs> right? For sure, for sure. Um, I'll, uh, hit me up on the DMs uh, on under Carl underscore Angelo underscore Rodriguez, my full name. Um, I do private mentorships. You know, you want to buy two to five properties. In six to 12 months, I'll privately coach you on how to do that um, and, and help you with the credit stuff. There's a lot of things that we can do, man. So Awesome. Is there anything else you wanted to share or is that pretty much it? Man, I think everybody who is on the sidelines yeah. waiting to buy a house, stop being on the sidelines because you're going to be part of the herd. Get into the sub two, wholesaling, uh, buying properties through seller finance. You're buying properties that you'd believe it or not, buy it at the price that you want in 2021. And it's not even going to show on your credit. So when the time comes, you want to go buy another house, the really, the nice house that you want to buy, right? Yeah. You can go buy it utilizing your credit because it's not affecting your debt to income. So, and by the way, you don't need 
60 or 100 properties like what I'm doing. You know what I mean, like <laughs> right. not everybody wants to build a school in the Philippines. But if you want to be financially free, you could have three to five short-term rentals that you own through seller finance, and you could go quit your job. And I promise you, as long as you manage it properly, you'll be all right. And that's something that you you offer as a yep. personal mentorship. Yep. Cool, yep. good to know. And you don't even need to have capital. As long as your credit's decent, I mean, I can get you to 750, 800 credit score awesome. in like 60 to 90 days. Cool, man. That's yeah. good to know. Yeah, so I think that wraps it up here. Yeah, man. I appreciate it. You know, this is, like I said, our first yep. Vital for Biz podcast. You know, I really appreciate yeah, you. I hope it was very by. vital, y'all. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think you gave a lot of good gems today. I think, uh, yeah, I think a lot of people are going to be excited about this. I'm excited. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, uh, definitely appreciate you. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. Your time. Thank you for having me. Most definitely. So, yeah, that wraps it up here. Uh, if you guys have any more questions, or if you guys have any questions, go ahead and leave us a comment. Um, be sure to like, follow, subscribe, and yeah, Vital for Biz. I'm yep. Gigahertz, and we're out. Yeah, thanks, man. I want to thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of Vital for Biz. I'm Gigahertz, and hopefully you got some inspirational insight for yourself and for your business. Make sure to give us a follow, vitalityplus.io on Instagram, and make sure to save this episode, subscribe, and share with a couple of your friends. Until then, until next time, keep thriving.